Jefferson and the founders believed a nation that governs itself like ours must rely upon an informed and engaged electorate. I don't know that there is a better academic or extracurricular activity than speech and debate when it comes to preparing students to embrace the responsibilities of citizenship. Some of the most thoughtful, well-educated, informed, and articulate people I've met in the course of my work here just happen to be teenagers who are involved in speech and debate. So despite the bad news about the state of civic learning in our country, you'll soon see a great example of why I'm, I for one am particularly optimistic. So our 16 finalists who you just saw have been debating all day today, and now we're down to the final two. The stakes are high. The winner tonight will receive a $10,000 college scholarship. So how many of you have had 30 minutes to win $10,000 in your life? Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with academic debate, I want to point out a few of the differences from the debates that you may have seen on TV in this presidential election cycle um, and in the competition we're about to have. And based on what I've seen so far from our competitors, I think our students would fare pretty well in this election cycle. Um, during Ronald Reagan's presidency, oh wait, sorry, oops. Um, all right. So the format, I find I'm missing a page, so I'm going to do a little extemporaneous speaking here, uh, which some of our speakers are very good at. Sometimes you, you, when you're missing a page in your, your speech, that happens. Um, so during, during the uh, competition, oh, that's okay, I got it. Uh, the, the speech is broken up into several different speeches. So each speaker will have a five minute opening statement. If you've seen the presidential debates, they have uh, a minute and sometimes two and 30 seconds to respond. So they'll have five minutes to make their case, followed by a four minute rebuttal period. Uh, and then they'll have something that's a lot of fun, crossfire, where they will get to engage and, and uh, challenge each other with questions. Uh, and then a bit of the competition that is unique uh, to this particular form of debate, uh, which is the moderators. The moderators get to chime in and ask questions of the debaters to kind of probe them. Uh, earlier in the uh, competition today, they had three minutes. Because this is our final round and the stakes are high, we're going to give our judges as many, as long as they want to ask as many questions as they want to make sure they're satisfied with the quality of our competitors on stage. Uh, and finally, they get to bring it all together, they get to close it and bring it on home. Uh, we have an esteemed judging panel today. Uh, we have, you'll see we have four judges at the table, uh, and we also, because the point of this competition is not just to kind of win a speech and debate competition, but the point of this competition is to win over your average person in the public. Uh, I would say, looking out at the faces of this crowd, this is an above average person of, from the public, so uh, your opinions are very much uh, important during this process. Uh, and so at the end of the debate, you will have an opportunity uh, to vote yourself. So using your smartphone, you will get a chance to be one of the five deciding votes in this competition. Uh, so without further ado, allow me to introduce our distinguished judging panel. Uh, our first judge at the table is an intern here at the Reagan Foundation, uh, an intern who comes to us from Eureka College, which those of you who have been through the museum know is President Reagan's alma mater. He also has a little bit of presidential experience himself, having served as the president of his class during the last school year, Mr. Aaron Meyer. On the other side, uh, we have a very good friend of ours here at the Reagan Foundation, one of our biggest friends in education, uh, Ms. Deborah Salgado, who is the Director of Secondary Education here in the Simi Valley Unified School District and is the visionary and driving force behind the Ronald Reagan Citizen Scholar Institute at Royal High School, uh, which just this year was awarded the Civic Learning Award of Excellence uh, by the State of California, one of only six such schools in the state. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, our third judge uh, is, I have a particular soft spot for her. One, she's my boss, uh, but two, she's our chief administrative officer here at the foundation. Uh, and if you want somebody who has had a front row seat of what it means to have traveled with and been around the great communicator, uh, Joanne Drake served uh, in the White House from 1984 on in the tra uh, presidential office of advance and now serves as our chief administrative officer. She also served as President Reagan's chief of staff during the final 10 years of his life. Uh, and has overseen things here at the museum, such as our 2011 remodel, uh, the funeral services for both President and Mrs. Reagan. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Joanne Drake. And finally, our head judge this evening, 
uh, who during Ronald Reagan's presidency served as the senior White House correspondent for the Washington Post, and during the course of his 26 years with the Post, received several awards, including uh, from the American Political Science Association, the Aldo Beckman Award for Excellence in Presidential Coverage, the Merriman Smith Award for Excellence in Deadline Reporting, the Gerald Ford Award for Lifetime Achievement in Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency, um, his 1991 book, President Reagan, The Role of the Lifetime, uh, is one of five books he has written on President Reagan, uh, and it was called The Best Study of That Enigmatic Presidency Yet Available by the New York Times. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our good friend and our head judge, Mr. Lou Cannon. And now, I would like to invite our two national finalists to the stage. Uh, so, First up, um, somebody who comes to us from not all that far away, uh, Mr. Alex Zeo. Alex is a rising senior at La Cañada High School in La Cañada, California, and qualified at our Western Regional Competition uh, in Sherman Oaks, California. He has qualified for the Tournament of Champions the past two years and is the co-president of the speech and debate team at his high school. He also loves hiking and recently started a club to organize hikes and nature outings. So Alex, please come take a seat on stage. And for those of you who are interested in the East Coast, West Coast rivalry, you are in for a treat because our other finalist hails from the other side of the country. Katie Kleinley qualified at our Northeastern Regional Competition in Mineola, New York, and is a recent graduate of Ridge High School in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. In the fall, she will be attending Trinity College, University of Dublin in Dublin, Ireland, and is planning to quintuple major, as you saw in the video, in philosophy, economics, politics, sociology, and German. Uh, could you fit any more? No? Okay. I had a trouble with one major. Uh, she was also ranked the number one congressional debater in the nation. In her spare time, Katie loves music, poetry, and art. So Katie, please come take a seat on the stage here. Now, Here's the interesting thing. For those of you who have seen the presidential debates, uh, you know, the, the candidates are, know their position. They know it well in advance. Our two debaters who are sitting here, this is another difference. As of this moment, they don't know which side they are debating. They are fully prepared to debate both sides. Uh, so as judges who are part of the audience, uh, I ask you to remember that when you are judging, not to judge them on the content or the specific policies that they are advocating for, but just how convincing they are, because both of them are prepared to argue either side. So really you're looking who is the most convincing. Uh, and so to determine which side they will be, I'm going to ask our head judge, Lou Cannon, to flip a coin in just a second, and I'm going to ask Katie if you could call it for us. Sure. I'm going to go with Tails. She's called Tails, and it is? Heads. It is tails. Heads, so, heads. Oh, it's, oh, it is heads. It is heads. So that means, Alex, you get to choose the side. So he's going to go negative. She's going to be the affirmative. And with that, we will get started. Enjoy the show. Are all of you ready? And just so you know, my phone is on airplane mode, but I use it as a timer, so I'm not like texting or anything up here. Okay. President Reagan himself once argued, I know in my heart that what is right will always eventually triumph. And by his own words, there's a reason that the two-party system has triumphed today. While it has its flaws, no system is perfect. And because this resolution only calls for us to weigh the harms against the good, I don't have to prove that the harms don't exist. Instead, as the pro, my burden is to prove that a two-party system on net is representative, fair, and democratic. Let's begin. First, the two-party system provides massive amounts of political stability. Scott Mainwaring writes for the Kellogg Institute for International Studies that only one country with a multi-party system and a presidential system like the United States has achieved stable democracy, and that's Chile. Otherwise, governments are constantly shifting back and forth from party to party, and it's not hard to imagine that happening inside the United States. Let's picture a multi-party system in the US. It's most likely that the biggest parties would end up being Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, and probably Green Party, and the shifts between them would be frequent. 
even in a relatively stable political climate, you would still have shifts. For example, if the climate was overwhelmingly liberal, there would still be shifts between Democrats and the Green Party. Or if the climate was conservative, there would still be shifts between Republicans and Libertarians. That leads to a lot of political instability, as the legislature and the executive branch are constantly transitioning. But this instability is compounded by the regents of the University of California, who write that in an election with more than two candidates, so many people would be vying for office that it's far less likely the winner would receive a simple majority of the votes. But if no candidate receives 270 votes from the Electoral College, or the simple majority, the election has to be sent to Congress. What would the outcome of that be? Most likely, gridlock, infighting, and a legislative branch with disproportionate power over our executive branch which decreases the legitimacy and the stability of the highest political office in our land. In a time of global and domestic political instability, our generation be should be striving to solve insecurity, not exacerbate it. A multi-party system is a convoluted, unstable, and dangerous system. For that reason, vote pro. But second, a two-party system gives all regions of the country an equal political voice. It's a well-established fact that different regions have different priorities. For example, the South tends to be disproportionately socially conservative, the West Coast tends to be socially liberal, the Rust Belt is more, con uh, more concerned with industry, and the Southwest tends to favor restricting immigration. Patterns like that go on across the country. But when we didn't have a two strong two-party system, these patterns were expressed in a different way. Specifically, regional differences were often expressed through smaller, single-issue parties. And a great example of this is the Know Nothing Party from the 1850s, which was a pre predominantly urban party concerned with restricting immigration. That demographic definitely still exists today. But based purely on the numbers, parties that would mainly appeal to smaller parts of the country could never win in a national election. That means that in a multi-party system, Parties that appealed more to states like Missouri, which has a major stake in agriculture, or to states like Alaska and the Dakotas, which really care about energy, they wouldn't succeed on the national stage. And that means that the voices of people in those states would be oppressed. These states are less populated and have niche interests. So under a multi-party system, they couldn't influence federal elections nearly as much as large, state, large states like New York or California. Their concerns would go unheard. Luckily, though, we have the current system whereby these smaller local issues are integrated into the platforms of huge national parties. An example being the immigration stances of the Republican Party, which are strongly influenced by their constituents in the Southwest. A joint study by professors Stephen Ansola Bahere and James Snyder of Harvard and William LeBlanc of MIT establishes that parties work together and choose platforms by majority rule, which ensures that different legislators from different parts of the country all have equal say in what the Republican platform is and in what the Democratic platform is. That means that those energy interests, those agricultural interests, all of those special interests from across the country are heard under the platforms of these two big national parties. But even specific local problems are solved for. Because on a local level, these politicians still have freedom. They can and do diverge from the national party platform frequently. And a great example of this is my home state of New Jersey, where politicians supported gay marriage even though they were in the Republican Party before that policy was passed by the Supreme Court. Basically, even though the national platform encompasses certain policy positions, local politicians can still change their opinions so they can tailor what policies they pass to be best for the people in their area. The two-party system addresses special and regional concerns in two ways, through their influence on party platform and through the freedom given to local politicians. Because a multi-party system would suppress parties from smaller, less populated areas, the current system maximizes representation of all regions, and that's what democracy is about. Is everyone ready? Let us never forget that government is ourselves and not an alien power over us. The ultimate rulers of our democracy are not a president and senators and congressmen and government officials, but the voters of this country. It is because I agree with our 32nd president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, that I negate the resolution. The American two-party system is fundamentally undemocratic and harmful for the public interest. First, the factional divisions created by the two-party system give rise to political gridlock and paralysis. The failure of elected officials to pass effective legislation is not only damaging to the public welfare, but also runs contrary to the values of democratic representation. In the past decade, Congress has consistently failed to create effective policy change. 
For instance, the increasing issues of economic instability and inequality have gone unaddressed by the government due to the two-party system. Lawler writes in 2015, partisan fragmentation has had calamitous results in public policy. The American public enjoys less prosperity today than it did when polarization was less pronounced. Income inequality is on the rise and economic crises are more difficult to avoid. Partisan behavior begets little policy change. The two-party system encourages black-white binaries on policy issues to offer the voter a clear choice between the two parties. Thus, we end up with the current polarization of the Democrats and Republicans, who rarely compromise on any issue. Such polarization shifts politics away from the interests of the average voter and toward elite interests. King, professor of public policy at Harvard University, writes in 97, vigorous two-party competition creates polarization. It creates polarization by bringing to the general election two candidates more likely to diverge from the median voters' wishes. The more party competition there is, the more diversions one expects from delegate-type representation. This directly answers my opponent's arguments that talk about how parties compromise and represent local interests. If parties are more uh, tending to represent elite interests, then they obviously are not de democratically accurate. Although this is perhaps an effective campaign strategy, this sort of political polarization is not conducive to effective policy. Polarization in Congress has stalled action on climate change. Democrats and Republicans gradually drift further and further away on environmental issues, ending rational debate. The Economist writes in 2014, the two-party system induces ideological rigidity. There is a natural tendency for each party to oppose the other. In the case of climate change, there was a time when Democrats and Republicans both agreed on the reality of the problem. But the dynamics of political argument led Republicans to deny global warming. In a two-party system, all political questions end up on a left-right axis. Each side spends its time trying to make more and more extremist claims. Political loyalty demands that one defend the positions held by one's own party and dissent equals betrayal. If the US government continues to ignore global warming, it is certain to permanently alter civilization as we know it. Food shortages, refugee flows, rising sea levels, and increasing drought will endanger our society. Scranton writes in 2013, the commander of the Pacific Command told that climate change was the greatest threat. Upheaval from increased temperatures, rising seas, and destabilization will destroy security more likely than other scenarios. Gridlock specifically led to the failure of congressional funding to contain the Zika virus. Polarization endangers American protections against natural disasters such as hurricanes and future diseases. Adler, journalist at the Grist, writes on June 28th, the Zika virus threatens to spread throughout the US, causing birth defects and paralyzing complications. This is a chilling reminder of how political dysfunction prevent timely response on climate-related disasters. We likely won't have a federal response to Zika this year. Second, the two-party system creates political leaders that do not truly represent the interests of the public. Despite offering voters a choice between two parties, elections in the current system do not offer any real freedom of choice. The parties force the voter to decide between bad and worse. This sort of uh, us versus them thinking trivializes real problems facing America, oversimplifying issues such as terrorism, inequality, and disease to a black-white binary. Koblenz writes in 2016, partisans on both sides are so angry they can barely speak with each other, must like work together. Each side is more extreme, and each bases their political agenda on demonizing the other side. The national debate presents every issue as a simplistic duality, which trivializes everything. We aren't having a rational discussion about anything, and the public is sick of it. 80% disapprove of Congress. This furthermore answers her argument that talks about how the current system is not representative or the current system is the best way for us to represent our interest. If instead the current two-party system places everything on a black-white binary, that does not accurately represent the problems that face America. Lastly, her first contention or her first argument talks about stability and the values of how we maintain regime stability. However, this is referencing largely developing and transitioning democracies and does not apply to an institutionalized democracy such as the United States that does not uh, suffer from the risk of armed insurgency or other types of revolutions. Thus, because the current two-party system is undemocratic and unaccountable, I urge a negative ballot in today's debate.
Everybody ready? Yes. All right. On one count, I actually agree with Alex. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a major proponent of rule by the people, and he was definitely one of the biggest embracers of democracy in our nation's history. But he was also one of the most iconic Democrats of all time, and a front runner of the Democratic Party as we know it today. And it's because he was one of the people who led to the two-party system that we have now, that he would actually embrace the pro side. And it's for his sake, and for the sake of the arguments that I'm about to name, that you should vote in the affirmative. First, let's address his point where Alex talks about how the two-party system encourages binaries, and how there's absolutely no compromise under it. That's not necessarily true or specific to the two-party system. In fact, it's specific to the leadership that we have today. If you look towards the past, if you look towards the 1900s, there was much more cooperation between Republicans and Democrats. And if you look towards now, we have the same two political parties in office. They're just cooperating less. But what that shows you is that it's the Republicans and Democrats who are in office now that aren't cooperating. It's not a flaw that's inherent to the system. Two-party systems do not inherently mean less cooperation. Instead, what we need to do is elect public officials under the two-party system who are willing to cooperate and who are willing to compromise. What we have right now, this binary, this divide that we see, is not a failure of the Republican or Democrat party in and of itself. It's a problem of the members of each therein. And if we're going to solve it, we just need to elect new politicians rather than completely overthrow the system and institute multiple parties. But next, let's look towards this point about elite interests. Sure, that's a problem under the status quo. I actually agree. But let's think about the alternative under a multi-party system. What's stopping elite interests from forming their own political group, from forming their own super PACs, from forming their own election, or from forming their own means of influencing elections, and thereby only increasing the oligarchy that we see in America today? Oligarchy and elite interests are also not specific to the two-party system. They will exist under a multi-party system or under a two-party system. And I would argue that under the two-party system or under the multi-party system, they're going to be worse. Because under a multi-party system, it's much easier for the wealthy to band together, to form their own groups, and to try and influence government in any way that they can. Right now, they're bound under the Republican or Democratic parties, both of which also have blue-collar members and members of the middle class. So right now, you see Republicans who are wealthy, who are middle class, and who are lower class. Same thing on the Democratic side. But that might not happen under a multi-party system. After these parties fragment, maybe they would fragment along socioeconomic lines, only furthering the divide that Alex is concerned about. For that reason, the two-party system does solve for inequality. Next, let's look towards the idea that under a multi-party system, there's no guarantee of an end to polarization. Let's look at countries that already have a multi-party system. Spain, the UK, Germany, uh, countries across Europe, including France. In all of these countries, we've seen fragmented, smaller political parties form coalitions, where small conservative political parties work together to pass legislation, and small liberal parties work together to pass legislation. There's still ideological fragmentation. There is still a binary, and there is still a divide between liberals and conservatives. The difference is that in those countries, it's just an, along co coalition lines instead of along the lines of two political parties. So even if the United States was under a multi-party system, we would still see this polarization. We would still see this fragmentation. We would still see the harms. None of those harms are specifically because of the two-party system. Next, let's look at his argument that we have no real options for communication across party lines. He says that parties discourage rational discussion. But if we had a multi-party system with dozens of parties vying for office, that doesn't guarantee that rationality would prevail. Instead, it guarantees that parties would do anything they could to set themselves out from others. And that would encourage mudslinging. It would encourage uh, parties to attack each other. And it would encourage a culture in which parties needed to step on each other in order to get the upper hand. That's not a culture that's democratic, and it's not a culture that's fair. Vote uh, pro. Is everyone ready? A crucial framing question for today's debate is whether the resolution asks that we compare the two-party system to an alternate multi-party system or whether we should just question the merits of the current system. The resolution asks you the benefits of the two-party system versus the harms. Nowhere in the resolution does it mention that I need to defend multi-party systems or a one-party system. This, the debate should center on the question of whether our current system does more good for the American public or more bad. 
This is a key framing issue for today's debate because a lot of Katie's answers to my case talk about how multiple parties would be worse, that they would stall negotiations, and that they would make her current governance even worse. But this is not relevant to today's debate. The question is not whether multiple parties are bad. It's whether the current two-party system is good. Now moving on to the specific arguments she's made, she states that other countries have also had polarization and stalling of government. However, first, once again, this is not relevant to today's debate. Second, it is impossible to directly compare American democracy to democracies from Spain or from Italy or from the UK. We simply have different systems of government. For instance, the UK has a parliamentary system which does not distinguish between the executive and legislative branch in the same way that the American democracy does. This kind of distinction is important because it proves that we cannot directly compare the policy outcomes of the UK against the policy outcomes of the United States. Next, she states that current polarization is specific to the leaders we have elected and not to the two-party system. However, first, you can reference again my King study, which is conducted by a professor of public policy at Harvard of congressional elections in the 90s. This has two major implications. First, it shows that it's not the specific candidates, but the party races themselves. Studies of both House and Senate races in the 90s, especially in Ohio's 6th district, found that polarization is augmented when there is increased distinction between the two uh, candidates, which increases the amount of separation on policy issues. Second, it proves that her argument is false, that it's not inherent to the system. It's, in fact, uh, these studies are conducted in the 90s that are not specific to current day leaders. Now, Kat uh, Katie has talked about how we need to provide an equal voice to people and ensure that all people have access to their local issues. However, I think that this point conclusively goes negative instead of uh, a pro uh, a point. Her argument is that we need to provide an equal voice for people and give them a choice in a democracy. However, our Copeland's evidence, which we read before, states that since the two-party system places all issues on a left-right binary, it simplifies all issues to either Democrat or Republican. This is obviously a false choice that prevents voters not with their true interests, but rather with a set of elite interests that have already been cultivated and curated for them to select from. This forces voters to choose between bad and worse, which is not really any sort of democratic choice at all. She talks about single issues in states like Missouri that have energy interests that now will not be represented. However, the two-party system with Democrats and Republicans will not do any better job of representing these interests. For instance, she talks about how these party platforms are decided by majority vote. If Missouri indeed does not have a large population, they will also not be represented at the Democratic National Convention. They will be outvoted, just as they would in any other system. However, in a multi-party system, uh, different parties can represent single issues and rise to take political risks that larger parties, such as the Democrats and Republicans, may not be able to do. So as a quick summary of the debate, I am not obligated to defend any specific model of democracy. I don't need to defend a one-party system. I don't need to defend a three-party system. I just need to prove that the current two-party system is bad. And I have proven conclusive to you why it is harmful to the public welfare. Because it is unaccountable, because it does not represent public interests, and because it results in inferior policy outcomes that threaten our, our national security through things such as climate change and income inequality. Thank you. All right. So, Alex, how can you say a democracy or a democratic system is either good or bad without comparing it to another one? Um, so I would say that, for instance, if you were choosing to attend a restaurant and you were comparing the merits of its food, you could do so by comparing whether it tastes good or bad. And similarly, in a democracy, we can decide the costs and benefits of the system without directly comparing it to another. And I don't think the resolution asks us to do that whatsoever. Um, I have a question for you about your regents evidence that you read in your case. Okay, sure. You talked about political instability and the differences between parties. Mm -hmm. Is this referencing American democracy or other democracies that are transitioning away from an authoritarian government to a democracy? It's not uh, referencing governments that are trans transitioning away from authoritarian governments. It's referencing governments across the world that are subject to multi-party systems, including countries like France, like Germany, like Chile, uh, like the UK, etc. 
Okay. Um, so what specifically about the multi-party system has increased polarization as compared to the two-party system? So under the multi-party system, I'm not necessarily saying that polarization would increase, although in some countries and in some cases it has. I'm saying that polarization still exists, and if anything, it has the potential to be worse, because what happens is that smaller, more fragmented political parties form coalitions to work together to pass legislation, and oftentimes those coalitions end up being either far right or far left. Right. We just saw that in the UK when a far right coalition decided to push forth Brexit. Right, so you've talked a lot about how these countries have had inferior policy outcomes to the United States and how they result in polarization, but why is it that proving another country's system is inferior to the United States prove that our current system is good for the American people? Because on net, first of all, I already proved the benefits in both of my contentions, but what I'm now doing is going forward and saying why you can't just say that democracy is good or bad as we have it right now without comparing it to something else. Because to say that it's bad would mean that we would need a better alternative. It's comparative. There's no such thing as just an inherently bad form of government unless there's a better one. Okay. Um, do you have a question for me? Um, I did, but I think it was answered. <laughs> Okay, sure. Um, so let's talk about your answer to the Koblenz evidence. Mm -hmm. You stated that um, this evidence is specific to our current leaders that states um, the polarization in black-white binary is not inherent to the system. Mm -hmm. What about our current leaders has made them specifically uh, have a tendency towards polarization? So right now, I think that a really big problem that's really exacerbated the issue of polarization is technology. We see a lot of things like Twitter flame wars between candidates. We see a lot of interviews with TV. Uh, you know, news anchors and things like that. The problem is that a lot of these candidates are becoming extremely polarized because they take to social media and they take to the media in general to get attention for themselves by attacking the other party instead of actually just forming coherent policy positions on their own. Okay. Uh, that's about time. Yeah. I guess. I have a question for both of you. If you were to create a third party, what would it be called and what would its platform be? Uh oh. Mm. <laughs> you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll, I can go first. Um, so I would say that I think um, the best name that would represent the interests that are currently disenfranchised would be the American Moderates Party. Um, as I talked about in my case, I said the current polarization has resulted in extremist interest and elite interest controlling the direction of the election rather than the specific interests of the average voter. Um, so their platform, I would say, hmm. I would say that on a lot of issues that are currently very fragmented, and in which the Democrats and Republicans take entirely opposing views on, this moderate party would try to take a middle ground on that in order to represent the medium voter. Um, so, for example, on the issue of climate change that I talked about before, uh, Democrats often favor a carbon tax, while Republicans uh, favor no carbon tax. I think this middle party would try to take a different approach to the problem and try to negotiate a different way for us to address climate change that would avoid the pitfalls of either side and ensure that both uh, moderates and independents are represented. So a few days ago, the Republican National Committee released its new platform for the 2016 election cycle, and they veered farther to the right than they have been in years. And I think in light of that, and in light of the fact that so many people are dissatisfied with the way that the RNC is running their party right now, it's really the conservatives more than the liberals who need a new party. So I would probably create a new party called the Conservative Moderate Party, um, because I think that the vast majority uh, of dissatisfied moderates right now tend to fall on the right side. Um, and their platform would probably be fiscal restraint without being you know, too far in the fiscal restraint direction. Um, I think that they would be more socially liberal than the Republican Party is right now. And I think that they would 
embrace more modern values in a lot of ways. Um, because I think that right now we see a lot of issues where politicians tend to be embracing values that they think people are going to follow just for the sake of gaining popularity among people in certain demographics of the U.S. instead of actually embracing things that, you know, the government has pushed forward in the past. I have a question for Katie. <clears throat> uh, you said in your opening statement that uh, you did, uh, said that <clears throat> United States and Chile, you were quoting somebody, are the only uh, stable democracies I, that, that, that don't change parties frequently. I, I, what about Sweden? You know, what about uh, 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 other Scandinavian countries? What about, despite the recent vote of the people on Brexit, what about uh, uh, the United Kingdom? I mean, it I seemed actually, to me you stretched, you stretched the point. I think you might have misheard me. I said that Chile is the only stable multi-party democracy that has the same uh, presidential system that we do. Well, these are all multi, uh, the, the, the Swedish uh, system and the, uh, the British system and the Norwegian system are all multi-party. They aren't presidential though. So what I'm saying is Chile is the best direct comparison to the United States government. A lot of those countries are parliamentary or they have a monarchy. And while they may be relative comparisons and while they may be good examples, they're not as directly comparable. Well, so I you, definitely agree they should be used. Do you think that Chile uh, uh, has been a democracy uh, long enough, a stable democracy long enough to compare it to the United States? No, uh, not necessarily in every way, but that doesn't mean that we can just throw it out as evidence. I think that it can still be used. It just needs to be weighed in the debate with that in mind. And I have a question for you, uh, uh, Alex. I don't um, quite understand the, the argument you're making on climate change. I understand well enough that the parties are gridlocked on it. Your description of their positions is accurate. But it doesn't seem to me that I, I know your, your burden of proof is not to prove that a multi-party system is better. But it doesn't seem to me that you've made a very convincing case about uh, why the climate change problem is going to be solved under, under any system, since those divisions represent not just party differences, but difference of states, whether they burn coal, whether they have alternative energy. Could you talk about that? Sure. Um, so I agree with you that the United States unilaterally cannot uh, prevent climate change or entirely uh, reduce carbon emissions all across the world. However, um, the point I was trying to make in my case is that the failure of any action by, the Cong uh, by Congress represents a failure of the U.S. government as a whole to mitigate, even lessen or alleviate the impacts of global warming. So I would say that um, my economist evidence talks about how Republicans and Democrats uh, a while before in the 80s and 90s had more convergence on issues of environment than they do today and how the increasing polarization of recent years has driven a wedge between the parties since they are incentivized to exaggerate their claims and separate their platforms to represent allegiance interests instead. Alex, you have started to answer my question, but I'm going to pose it to you anyway in case you want to expand on it sure. a little more. You said that um, polarization is augmented by the parties. Can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, sure. So the two-party system places uh, Democrats on the left and Republicans on the right. And because it creates a binary sort of thinking, both parties are incentivized to increase the amount of difference they have between the two parties. So I gave a few instances of climate change and disease and how the two parties distinguish themselves from one another on these issues. That means they drive them each other further to the left and further to the right in order to destroy a middle ground that would represent a good compromise between the two parties. Thank you. Um, Katie, mm -hmm. you talked about um, that having a two-party system creates stability. And, and Alex, in his rebuttal, talked about, well, we already have a stable country. so. Can you expand on that a little more and talk about the positives of that? Sure. I mean, we already have a stable country because we already have a two-party system. And I think that if you look towards other countries with multi-party democracies, what they have is a constant shift. Every few years, they have a new political party in power. Here, we only have a new political party in power even less frequently than in other countries. And here, when we see transitions between the political parties, we have, you know, the Republicans taking office and then saying they're going to repeal Obamacare, the Democrats taking office and saying they're going to block Republicans from passing legislation. So every time we have one of these uh, demographic transitions within the government, we see gridlock. 
And the problem is that with a multi-party system, these transitions would only become increasingly frequent, and we would have more and more turnover with more and more uh, political parties continuing to control the government at a faster pace. Thank you. All right, Alex, I have a question for you. Um, so I am aware that many of the Founding Fathers believe that we should not have political parties at all. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, you said that you don't have to take any, a side on either one, but I'd like you to take a side. So would you rather have no political parties or a multi-party system? Um, that's a good question. I think that the Founding Fathers, when they said that no parties would be the best option, didn't really consider how large our democracy would become. And I think that, yes, some parties are necessary. So I would say if I was forced to take a stance on that, I would say multiple parties would be preferable. Um, since in our current democracy, uh, parties require large organizational resources and they need a consistent policy platform that just individual candidates running for an election wouldn't be able to capture. Okay. And then Katie, uh, you mentioned in the crossfire the, the effects of social media on candidates and Twitter wars and all that. Would you say that that is uh, putting a magnifying glass to the types of candidates we are seeing today? Or do you think that uh, maybe this kind of thing has always existed, but it's just giving them a platform? Because part of your argument was that we need better candidates, but it, is it really, are there the better candidates out there? Uh, you, does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. I think that candidates like that have always existed. But with the advent of social media and with the, ad, uh, the advent of the 24-hour news cycle, candidates like that have more of a platform and more of a voice than they ever did before. So whereas in the past, people couldn't just tune onto their TV and watch a politician giving a speech, uh, they had to look at the actual policy positions. Now, candidates are just vying to be the loudest ones and the ones who are talked about most on the 24-hour news cycle so that they get the most media attention, the most people hear their name. Because as unfortunate as it is, a large amount of the voting that goes on in America is based on name recognition and party affiliation. Alex, I would like to know if there was a serious third party being established in this country would you join it? And Katie, I want to know if you would work against that. Um, that's a great question. Um, I would say it really has to depend on the policy platform of the party. I would have to learn about what they stand for and what they represent. And I think if their interests align with mine, um, then I would join that party and I would defend its right to compete against the Democrats and Republicans. I agree. I think that I wouldn't arbitrarily say I would join any political party without knowing its platform. That's kind of dangerous. Um, but what I would say is that if I was a member of one of the two major parties and that, po uh, that party aligned with my policy interests, it would make more sense for me to work with them and sort of try to integrate them into the national platform of whether they were conservative or Democrat, the larger party. And we've already seen that happen with groups like the Tea Party and with Bernie Sanders followers who are predominantly, a lot of them are socialists. My last question. Are you both 18? I'm still 17. Are you August 18? 21st I will be. <laughs> Do you know how to go register to vote? I'm already registered. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. I don't, I don't have, I was just, I had a, just a very general question. If and either you give a very short answer. I, I'm curious as to, uh, your arguments are both very good very good on both sides. What do either of you think about divided government, by which I mean having a con one party control the Congress or a branch of the Congress and one party control the presidency, the White House? I think... Should... I mean, do you think it's better to have a divided government, I guess, or have a, a unified government where one party controls? I think it depends on the circumstance and it depends on the members of that government at the time. Because if you have a member of the executive branch who is one party, party X, and then you have members of the legislative branch who are another party, party Y, and they're not willing to work together, then a divided government is going to be absolutely destructive. The president will veto all of the legislative branch's legislation, and the legislative branch won't try to uphold the president's ideals. But if they can work together and they're of opposite parties, then I think that would make the government incredibly strong because you would have two voices from opposite sides of the aisle working together, which means that every one of all of those parties would be represented. Ideally, that would be my perfect world. I agree that it in, uh, often depends on the people who are in the government and their costs and benefits to having a divided government. So for instance, um, as Katie talked about, having a, for example, Republican uh, Congress and Democratic president as we have today 
uh, provides balance so that one party cannot dominate the political conversation and ensures compromise. Um, but unfortunately, when if the two parties are so polarized as we see today that they are entirely distinct and unable to agree on anything, that sacrifices all the benefits of political compromise and conversation that would exist in a divided government. A minute 15 when you stopped. Everybody ready? Okay. First, let's talk about the resolution itself. Sure, it only asks for the benefits versus the harms of the two-party system. But there's no way that we can weigh these benefits versus harms without comparing what we have to what other systems have. Because democracy does not exist in a vacuum. Right now, the two-party system is our vehicle to democracy. And to say that it instills a net harm implies that it's a bad thing. But because it provides us democracy, I would argue that it's a good thing. And unless Alex can prove that there's a system that provides a better democracy with enhanced freedoms and more representation, then ours is providing a net benefit because it's providing freedom and it's providing representation. Now, let's look at my examples of other countries. Alex says that we should throw them out, all of the UK and France and all of those countries because they don't necessarily have the same political system that we have. Sure, let's do that. But then let's look towards Chile, which, which, like I said before, has an identical government structure to ours. They still have all of the problems that I spoke about and all of the problems that Alex thinks is a concern as well. They still have instability, they still have new parties vying for power every election cycle, and they still have uncertainty as to who's going to be controlling their government after every election. They also still have coalitions. Alex spoke extensively about the problems between the black-white binary that a two-party system provides, where conservatives and liberals are pitted against each other. But that's not because of the two-party system. That is inherent to all democracy. That is not a flaw of the system itself. And if we look towards Chile, we see that within their fragmented government, smaller political parties, conservatives, form uh, coalitions. Smaller liberal parties also form coalitions, and they still have the black-white binary. So it's not a net harm of the two-party system specifically that's causing this. It's just a natural uh, collateral of democracy and of all democratic systems across the world. But next, let's look towards my argument about stability. Now, Alex never addressed my evidence from the Regents of the University of California that says that the two-party system means that candidates can easily get a majority and it decreases the likelihood of an election having to go to the House of Representatives. That's a good thing, because if we had ele an electoral system that forced elections into the House of Representatives, we would see massive harms. We would see gridlock. We would see a legislative branch with disproportionate influence over the highest governmental office in our land. And looking at how dysfunctional Congress is right now, I don't think any of us want or would trust in a system that caused that. Our system right now solves for that, and that is why it is a net benefit. 
But next, let's look at my argument about political voices and how integrating regions with less people into federal party platforms provides them a better voice. Again, Alex didn't really address this. Uh, because right now, representatives from every state go towards uh, the national conventions. Because states like Iowa and Ohio are so important, regardless of how many people they have, all interests in the country are represented fairly. People from every region are able to influence the national parties. And for that reason, it is fair and democratic to everyone. Every American, regardless of who they are or where they live. Vote pro. Is everyone ready? To start my speech, I'll return to the question of what my role as a negative is to in today's debate. Katie returns to the question of saying how she just needs to prove that the two-party system is preferable to other alternatives and that it works and is functional. However, that's not the resolution, what the resolution asks. It's true that perhaps we cannot view democracy as good or bad in a vacuum, However, the resolution provides us with a reference point, the merits and the cost of our current system to the American public. If I can prove to you that the cost of the current system have damaged the public welfare more than it's helped it, then I should win today's debate. The first reason that you should be voting negative in today's debate is that of political gridlock. The current two-party system has resulted in inferior policy outcomes that damage the public welfare. Issues such as income inequality and climate change require speedy and effective government action. In absent the sort of co political compromise and cooperation that is necessary in government, the go uh, American people will face increasing security threats. She gives the example of Chile and talks about how the multi-party system is insufficient in this country. However, there are a couple reasons why Chile as a democracy cannot be compared to the United States. First, Chile, is multi uh, their economy is comprised mostly of mining and other resource extraction industries. This lends energy a disproportionate amount of voice in their democracy, which shapes the way that its Congress and its presidential system works. Second, Chile is a relatively new democracy compared to that of the United States. Its constitution is not as robustly established, and voters do not yet have the party, strong party affiliations that an institutionalized democracy like the United States does. The second key issue that you should be voting for today is that of representation. The two-party system leads both parties to flee to the left and to the right, leaving the people in the middle in the dust. This means that many of the people who identified as moderate and independents of the United States, which is uh, identified as over 40%, are left in the dust and are disenfranchised by the fact that the elite interests of the two parties have not represented them in government. Katie talks about social media and how this is the cause of polarization. However, my King study accounts for this. From 1997, he states that back then there was no internet. 
there was no ability for social media to influence them in the same way that it does today. And even then, the two-party system lent itself to dramatic polarization and increased distinctions between candidates. So as a quick summary of today's debate, the question you should ask yourself at the end of the round, has the two-party system resulted in more good or more harm to the American people? If you believe that the current system is unaccountable, undemocratic, and antithetical to the public welfare, as I have shown you, then you should vote negative in today's debate. Her examples of Chile and social media are not sufficient to win her deba the debate because they are not directly relevant to the question of the resolution. Thus, I urge you to vote negative because the current system is undemocratic and unaccountable. Thank you. So thank you both very much. Uh, I'm going to invite you to take a seat back in the audience uh, just for a minute. Um, so as I mentioned at the outset of the debate, uh, we have our four judges here, but each of you in the audience is also invited to help us judge. And I'm going to talk you through that process right now. Uh, I'm also going to invite each of our final round debaters. Uh, you can also vote just as a presidential candidate might vote for themselves in the election. Uh, but I'm going to talk you through this. So if you have a smartphone uh, or a laptop or a tablet or a mainframe computer uh, that has internet access, you can pull that out. Uh, but go ahead and so I'm going to ask you to go to the website. It says in the program govote.at. That website was not working when we were setting this up earlier today. Thank you, technology. But uh, So instead, we're going to ask you to go to a different website. It's menti.com, M-E-N-T-I. Dot com. I'll give you a second to go there. If you don't have a smartphone, you can collaborate with the person next to you. That's okay. Or the person with the mainframe. Uh, M-E-N-T-I dot com. And when you get there, it's going to ask you for a code. I'm going to give you a six-digit code. I'll read it a couple of times for you. It's 925810. So 925810. 10. And then when you get to that screen and you enter that code, it should pull up a little screen that says, who is the next great communicator? And you have two options, affirmative, uh, which was Katie, and negative, which was Alex. And go ahead and make your selection for the person that you thought was the next great communicator. And then you can click on submit. And once all those votes are tallied, that will count into our official account and we'll come by and collect the, uh, I'm gonna give the judges just a minute or two more to finish up. Judges, once you have circled the person who you thought won, we're gonna come by and collect those and we're gonna reveal those in just a few minutes. So I'll say it one more time just in case there's anybody who's still, so menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And then the code is 925810. All right, so everybody should have submitted their vote at that point. Um, so our judges, when you have completed your ballot, uh, if you just want to hold it up, Rebecca from our team will come by and collect it. And so I'm going to put our competitors through just a little bit of, they've been waiting all day, they can wait a few more minutes, and I apologize for that, but uh, we mean to do it in the nicest possible way, but it's only because uh, we uh, have a very special speaker who's about to come up and, and give a little bit of thoughts on the power of communication. Uh, we're going to invite to the stage a speaker who's no stranger to the idea of what it means to be a powerful and effective communicator. In addition to his credentials that I listed earlier when introducing him uh, in his celebrated career as a journalist and author, our speaker has served as the Rasnick Distinguished Lecturer at UC Santa Barbara and the Freedom Forum Journalist in Residence at the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Southern California. Here tonight to share his thoughts on communication, uh, it is my pleasure to invite to the stage our head judge, Mr. Lou Cannon.
don't get up here as quickly as I used to. Um, can anybody hear me? I speak in the microphone, okay? In the back, can you hear me? Uh, first of all, I want to say that um, I was just blown away by these two competitors, Katie and Alex, and I found it very... Very hard to judge between them. I, uh, they're both great communicators in my book. And I, I, I want to say uh, thank you, Tony. And uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to return to the library here. My wife, Mary, and I have many friends here, especially uh, uh, Joanne Drake, who's been so kind to us over the years. Thank you, Joanne. And uh, I've researched books here. I've spoken on various occasions. And this library is a valuable resource for scholars and ordinary citizens alike. It also opens a, a window into the world of communication, political communication, particularly my topic tonight. Uh, this is the debater's night. Uh, uh, Katie and Alex and the other uh, 14 of you who have uh, uh, worked so hard, uh, it's not my night. And I'm going to try to follow uh, up here uh, the speech making mantra of one of our most transformational presidents, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who said he was advising one of his sons to give on how to give a speech. He said, be brief, be sincere, be seated. <laughs> but if you, here at the Reagan Library, if you wander through the museum here, which is both enlightening and accessible, you're going to find many reminders of events in which a president's words changed history. One powerful example is the speech President Reagan gave on June 12, 1987 at the Brandenburg Gate, urging Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev to tear down the Berlin Wall that loomed behind him. Loudspeakers from the East uh, German side of the wall are trying to drown him out, and Reagan's voice rises so it can be heard among, above them. I covered that event for the Washington Post, and in my mind's ear can still hear Reagan saying, Mr. Gorbachev opened that gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Reagan was called a great communicator, as we all know, but it's a sobriquet about which he had mixed feelings. In his farewell speech from the Oval Office on January 11, 1989, Reagan said that it wasn't his style or words that made the difference, but the content. I wasn't a great communicator, he said, but I communicated great things, and they didn't spring full blown from my brow, they came from the heart of a great nation, from our experience, our wisdom, and our belief in the principles that have guided us for two centuries. Reagan emphasized content over communication, in part because he realized that his critics didn't want to acknowledge that it was the message, as well as the messenger, that resonated with the American people. But Reagan's modesty aside, there's no denying he was a great communicator his direct and evocative style, his use of homespun anecdotes, and his self-deprecating humor enabled him to reach people in a way that others with a similar message couldn't. Perhaps, uh, I'm like Tony here, I got my pages mixed up. Uh, uh, once when Ronald Reagan was speaking in Florida outside, a wind blew up, uh, came up and blew away his cards uh, that he used. Uh, they were four by six, not three by five, as is usually said, and he picked them up and he looked up to the crowd and he said, it doesn't really matter what order these are in anyway, <laughs> and <laughs> proceeded to give his speech. Reagan's, Reagan's voice uh, was his great gift. He, he was a voice, wrote Roger Rosenblatt, <clears throat> which recedes at the right moment, turning mellow at points of intensity so as to win you over by intimacy. He likes his voice, treats it as a guest. He makes you part of the hospitality. Reagan's voice was honed on radio, which was the <clears throat> exciting, most exciting tool of mass communication early in the 20th century. Uh, the, the young people, not just the young people in this room, take for granted all these array of high-tech devices. We just, we just voted in one of those. Uh, but there wasn't any such communication when radio came into our lives. For most of our nation's existence, mass communication uh, in the United States was conducted by the printed word. Pamphlets during the Revolutionary Era, Tom Paine, whom Reagan often quoted, his, his uh, pamphlet, Common Sense, ignited, uh, helped ignite the American Revolution. 
And for the first two decades throughout the 19th century and the first two decades of the 20th, uh, most mass communication was through newspapers. Now, I've spent m much of my life writing for newspapers, and I still read two of them every day. Most Americans don't read one. A Pew study early this year found that only 5% of people uh, <laughs> glean their latest political news from newspapers. The internet overtook newspapers as the major source of news in 2008, uh, and the Pew study found that only 62% 62 62 of their adult Americans now get their news from social media. But newspapers had a long run, and I don't think they're quite dead yet. Successful American politicians from Thomas Jefferson through Barack Obama have cultivated reporters and columnists to advance their political agenda. Theodore Roosevelt, who was president from 1901 to 1909 and a, and, a, and a highly skilled communicator, said that he had discovered Mondays. What he meant by that was that uh, he'd observed that newspapers were short uh, political news on Monday, and he filled the gap by inviting reporters to the White House and giving them stories for the Monday papers. Uh, before going on to radio, I want to give a shout out to something that isn't usually included when we talk about mass communication. That something is the railroad. Before air travel was commonplace, presidential gave speeches from the backs of trains that were reported in the newspapers and uh, uh, were big events in the towns to which the trains came. Woodrow Wilson crisscrossed the United States uh, by train in a heartfelt but ultimately unsuccessful uh, uh, campaign to sell his countrymen on the uh, joining the League of Nations, FDR, uh, uh, who is crippled by polio, remem is remembered for his Johnny waves to the crowds from open limousines, but, but it was easier and usually more effective for him to travel by train. The most famous use of the train was by Harry Truman in his 1948 whistle stop campaign. I was four, 15 years old when Ray, Truman came to my hometown of Reno, Nevada on September 22, 1948. My father owned a small store that fronted on the train station, and we walked over to hear him speak. Truman at the time seemed a pygmy in comparison to FDR, who was president the first 12 years of my life and was deified in my family and the families of many of my friends. But Truman spoke well and plainly in this nasal Missouri twang, holding forth from the caboose of the train. I have read the speech he gave that day online, courtesy of the Truman Library. It contains a lot more useful information than you'd find in most speeches today. But I, that's not what I remember about it. What I remember is that Truman roused the crowd, prompt, uh, 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 pro criticizing the, the do-nothing 80th Congress. It had actually done quite a bit, just not things that Truman liked very much. And prompting shouts from the crowd of, give them hell, Harry. Uh, Truman responded with a famous line, they say, uh, I give them hell, but I just tell the truth and the Republicans think it's hell. Uh, my father had been lukewarm about Truman. He came back to the store all fired up and told my mother that Truman might beat the Republican nominee, Thomas E. Dewey. I don't know if she believed him. Dewey was heavily favored and ahead in the polls, but Truman pulled off the greatest election upset in the history of U.S. presidential elections. He wasn't much of a radio speaker, though. FDR was the premier radio communicator giving speeches to the American people that he described as fireside chats. L FDR was well born, but he had a common touch, perhaps a byproduct of this struggle with the, the polio, I think, that had crippled him. To people listening as a family around oversized radios as we did, FDR came right into the living room talking to ordinary Americans who were scraping by in the Great Depression as if he were a member of the family. Ronald Reagan was then a student at Eureka, and he was Eureka College, and he was transfixed by these speeches, and he could do a passable imitation of FDR. When I was interviewing Reagan for my first book about him, he quoted the celebrated lines from FDR's inaugural speech, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance, and lapsed I think without knowing it, into Roosevelt's cadences. Reagan had different goals than FDR, his first political hero, but he shared with him a great faith in the American people 
and a speaking style that conveyed optimism and courage, qualities that both of them possessed in abundance. Reagan also recycled some of FDR's best line. For instance, the resonant uh, rhetorical question that Reagan posed in the 1980 presidential campaign, are you better off than you were four years ago, was an altered borrowing from a 1934 fireside chat in which FDR was urging election of a Democratic Congress. He asked his listeners if they were better off than they had been under Herbert Hoover. Mindful of FDR advice about being seated, I'm going to try to fast forward this and talk about television. It began flourishing as a political medium in the 50s, but its first great impact came in 1960 at the debate between uh, John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Some historians think it made the difference in the election, which uh, Kennedy won by, by a, a hair's breadth. Um, interesting, those who saw the debate on television thought Kennedy had won. Those who heard it on the radio thought, thought that Nixon had. Nixon wasn't, wasn't well when he, when he conducted that debate, and he had lost a lot of weight, and it, looked, it showed on TV. JFK was telegenic, and his inaugural address Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country ranks among the best inaugural speeches of all time. Many members of the old media, they disdain television. We thought it a deceptive medium in which facile and glib personalities uh, could get away with things. Reagan knew better. He told me that you couldn't fool the camera, and he was largely right about that. But you did become more overexposed, more easily exposed on television than radio, and Reagan realized that too. After he lost the Republican nomination to Gerald Ford in 1976, CBS offered him a role as a, 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 com, a regular commentary, which is a big, big offer, but Reagan turned it down. He believed he could better keep his name before the public with the weekly uh, radio shows and newspaper columns uh, that he wrote. I'm going to leave you to judge who's been the most effective communicator in the White House since Reagan left office. I'd probably give a slight nod to Bill Clinton, although H George H.W. Bush and certainly President Obama, who's an inspirational orator, have had their moments. All presidents do. Overall, George W. Bush won't be remembered as a great communicator, but his remarks in the rubble of the 9-11 terrorist bombing in New York City stirred Americans as much as any speech by any president. It's called rising to the occasion. Now, the question is, would any, will anybody be able to do that in, in 2016? I, I don't think it's happened yet, although we certainly had a many, many, many terrible occasions, uh, the latest of which is the attack in Nice. But let me pivot here at the final, for the final section of this talk to make some observations about political communication in the age of the internet. Uh, and there was some re references to these things in, uh, in Katie's part of the debate. N never have candidates or commentators been able to reach people so quickly. Yet never in modern times has political commentary been more uh, abusive, debased, and really unconcerned with the scientific facts. I think the internet and social media shoulder a chunk of, this of the blame for this. I say that as one who uses the internet regularly to research columns and books and speeches, I'm so grateful for its existence. Uh, my wife Mary is my researcher uh, uh, on my, my, many of my books, and she would spend weeks or she have, uh, doing things you can look now up in a few seconds or minutes on, uh, on Google. Uh, but the internet enslaves as well as liberates. Along with other social media, it has the capability of bringing people together, but it can also accentuate the isolation of those who feel alienated from society. I hope I'm not painting with too broad a brush when I observe that a number of the people who have committed violence or terrorist acts have corresponded secretly with like-minded conspiracy theorists or haters on the internet and seem to have been empowered by their communications. Twenty years ago, while the inf internet was in its infancy and Facebook did not exist, the sociologist Robert Putnam wrote a book called Bowling Alone, 
that catalog the decline of institutions that gave us a sense of community, service clubs and the fraternal groups that were woven into the fabric of our society. Putnam wrote that we sign fewer petitions, belong to fewer organizations that meet, know our neighbors less, meet with friends less frequently. I'm not talking about uh, liking friends on Facebook, but meeting with them, and even socializing with our families less often. The title of the book came from data that showed that more Americans were bowling than ever before, but not together in leagues. The phenomena he described has since increased exponentially. When I grew up, the town communist and the town money crank, we all knew who they were. The money crank was a guy who was much like, uh, uh, if you've seen Saroyan's, William Saroyan's wonderful play, Our Town, and he, the, he is a drunk who regularly disrupts gatherings by reciting the peroration of William Jennings Bryan's speech to the Democratic Convention of 1896, you shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. We thought, we thought he was funny. Democrats and Republicans and independents alike. The crank, not Brian. Uh, on the internet, by contrast, uh, people aren't talking to each other we, we, the way we talked to in those days. They talk to people who share their political faith more than they converse across the political divide. Many of the com comments are abusive. They describe the other side as enemy. Google George W. Bush and the word Nazi and you'll get three million hits. Google Barack Obama and the word socialist and you'll get 17 million hits. In theory, the internet could foster a, a, a wonderful exchange of ideas. More often, what we have is reinforcement of the views we already hold and in, in the worst cases, uninformed demagoguery. So I say to the people in here, in this room or anywhere, who condemn congressional gridlock as we all sort of do, that the members of Congress may be reflecting their constituents. And perhaps those of us who deplore this current presidential campaign, the first in which majorities of the public distrust both of the presumptive presidential nominees, should take a collective look in the mirror. Hillary Trump, Clinton and even Donald Trump are the effects of what we've been doing to ourselves rather than the cause. I want to end on first a lighter and then I hope a more inspirational note. In my days as a state capital reporter in the 1960s, I knew a state senator with a simple prescription for political communication. Every political speech, he said, the, the candidate, the speaker, must point with pride, view with alarm, and wave the American flag. And he would twirl an imaginary flag and twirl around as he spoke. Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan on occasion waved the flag, but they did so much more. Unlike the negative communicators who dominate the political landscape today, they had faith in the future and in the ability of us, the American people, to make a better world for ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren, and I should say, in my case, our great-grandchildren. FDR said, we have always held to the hope, the belief, the conviction that there is a better life, a better world beyond the horizon. Ronald Reagan said, let us be sure that those who come after us will say of us in our time that we did everything that could be done. We finished the race, we kept them free, uh, we kept the faith. Let us, like FDR and Reagan, look to the future and ho with the hope that we all leave our country in a better way than we found it. Flee, but he won't let me. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to invite our other judges up to the stage. And actually, we'll have you stand right up here. Uh, we're going to hand out the trophies here. And uh, before we announce our national champion, we want to recognize all of our national finalists from across the country. So I'm inviting our other final round judges to join us here on the stage to help present the awards. And so, uh, other national finalists, uh, when I call your name, uh, please come up to the stage. As you're walking to the stage, I'm going to read a little bit about your, your bio. Um, and uh, we'll ask you to come. You'll stand here in the, in the middle. You'll take a picture with our judges, uh, and then we'll, we'll cycle through. Uh, so, for our national finalists, uh, each of the next eight 
the students who I call to the stage will receive a $1,000 scholarship. First, I'd like to call Alex Millard. Alex is a recent graduate from Truman High School in Independence, Missouri, and qualified at our Midwest Regional Competition in his hometown of Independence. He will be attending Stanford University to study political science next fall. After gaining his bachelor's degree, he plans to attend law school. Congratulations. <laughs> next up, Austin Janik. Austin is a recent graduate of the Grace Academy from right here in Simi Valley, California. He qualified at our Western Regional Competition in Sherman Oaks, California, and will be attending California Lutheran University. He has participated in speech and debate over the last four years and is an accomplished magician as well, who has performed at the Magic Castle in Hollywood and on CW's Penn and Teller Fool Us alongside famous magicians Penn and Teller. So congratulations, Austin. Next up is Kara Day. Kara is a rising senior at St. Agnes Academy in Houston, Texas, and qualified at our Greater Texas Regional Competition in Pflugerville. She's attended the Tournament of Champions and also qualified for the Ten Texas Forensic Association State Congressional Debate twice. She's also involved in mock trial, Harvard Model Congress, and has studied ballet for 13 years with the Houston Ballet. Congratulations. Next up is Carlos Gregory. Carlos is a rising senior at Hendrickson High School in Pflugerville, Texas, and qualified at our greater Texas Regional as well. In addition to debate, Carlos plays soccer, through which he's been fortunate enough to travel across the country and visit states such as Florida, Massachusetts, and California. So congratulations, Carlos. Congratulations. Next up is Gabriel Jankowski. Gabriel is a recent graduate of Woodrow Wilson High School in Dallas, Texas, and will be attending Northwestern University in the fall and majoring in history. He aspires to one day study for his PhD in history as well. He was ranked as one of the top two speakers for the National Association for Urban Debate Leagues and has played lacrosse for five years before completely committing to debate. Congratulations. Next up is Lenny Bryan. There's Lenny. Lenny is a recent graduate from Walter Payton College Prep High School in Chicago, Illinois. He will be studying the University of Pittsburgh to study political science and philosophy and will, deba will be debating for the William Pitt Debating, debating Unit. Uh, Lenny was ranked in the top 20 teams in the nation in policy debate and was the top speaker for the NAUDL. So congratulations. Gage Cohen. Gage is a recent graduate from Lighthouse Christian Academy in Bloomington, Indiana, and he qualified at our Midwestern Regional Competition uh, in Independence, Missouri, and it was the first time he had competed, competed in speech and debate. Uh, next fall, he will be attending George Washington University to study international affairs and public policy. A self-possessed or professed political junkie, he had the opportunity to work on Ted Cruz's campaign during the primaries. He also studies Spanish, Chinese, and plans to study Arabic in the fall. Congratulations. Uh, Vincent Lee is our next one. Vincent Lee is a rising senior at Poolsville High School in Poolsville, Maryland, and qualified at our Mid-Atlantic Regional Competition in Washington, D.C. He's interested in political science and plans to study when he attends college next fall. Uh, Vincent's future plans also include attending law school and being a lawyer. So congratulations, Vincent. <laughs> next up are our quarterfinalists. Each of our quarterfinalists will receive a $2,000 scholarship. First up is Ben Rankin. Ben is a recent graduate of Central High School in Springfield, Missouri. He qualified from our online regional competition and will attend the University of Missouri, Kansas City to study political science. 
He hopes to use his debate experience to have a positive effect on the world through public service. So congratulations, Ben. Uh, Micah Cash. <laughs> Micah is a recent graduate of Booker T. Washington High School in Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. In the fall, he will attend Stanford University. Micah is a state champion in the Lincoln-Douglas debate and also a state and national champion in domestic extemporaneous speaking. Congratulations, Micah. <laughs> Marshall Webb. Marshall is a recent graduate of St. Mary's Hall in San Antonio, Texas. He will attend Georgetown University to study international politics next fall. He's a two-time Texas champion in domestic extemporaneous speaking and is also the 2016 National Speech and Debate Association Student of the Year. Congratulations, Marshall. Ronald Thompson. Ronald is a recent graduate from Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C. and qualified at our Mid-Atlantic Regional Competition. He'll be attending Hampton University to study political science and history. And while living and working in our nation's capital, Ronald's had the opportunity to meet many fascinating political figures, including Andrea Mitchell, Newt Gingrich, Chuck Todd, and John King. Congratulations. Our semi-finalists, each of these uh, two will receive a $3,500 scholarship. First up is Justin Kang. <laughs> Justin is a recent graduate of Syosset High School in Syosset, New York. Justin qualified in our online competition and will be attending NYU Stern School of Business to study finance. He has extensive debate experience, including the National Speech and Debate Association tournament and tournaments at prestigious institutions such as Yale, Harvard, and Princeton. So congratulations, Justin. <laughs> Our other semi-finalist, Peter Charlambus. Peter is a recent graduate of Chaminade High School in Mineola, New York, and qualified at our Northeastern Regional Competition. He will attend Dartmouth College to study government and history. He's worked at a camp for special needs residents of Hempstead, New York, and volunteers with the Nassau County AHRC, an organization which help, helps peace, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Congratulations, Peter. And finally, I am going to invite both of our finalists to the stage, and I'm gonna invite Mr. Lou Cannon over to announce our runner-up and our national champion. So maybe, Aaron, if you could hold the uh, trophy until. <laughs> so, we'll wait till they get up here. But the, uh, that's the prize. Okay, right do I announce it? Uh, and as soon as they get up here, okay. we'll have them both stand on stage and then we'll let you announce. Uh, I want to announce the runner-up is Alex Chow. The, the champion, which he's figured out by now, <laughs> uh, is, uh, uh, it says on a four to one vote, I should have said Alex gets a $7,000 scholarship and our, our champion, Katie Kleinley, is, will get a $10,000 scholarship and uh, congratulations. <laughs> 